a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History. I'm here at the Australian National University with Professor Joan Beaumont and we're going to talk about a period of Australian history that I'm absolutely fascinated with. It's a, it's a, a period that probably doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. It's that period immediately after the First World War when the soldiers came home. We spend a lot of time talking about combat, talking about battle, talking about people that were killed. But most men weren't killed. Most men survived the war and came back. And, and what sort of Australia did they come back to? Um, Professor Beaumont, thank you so much for joining us on the program. My pleasure, Matt. You wrote a wonderful book uh, several years ago called Broken Nation, which looked at this in depth, Australia after the First World War, this very difficult time leading up to the Great Depression. How that the reality of Australia after the First World War, do you feel that as Australians we have an accurate perception of what our country was actually like? immediately after the First World War? No, I don't think we do. Uh, as you've said, we've put a lot of emphasis on the war itself and and everyone acknowledges that there were problems that soldiers and families encountered in adjusting to the return of the soldiers. But then the narrative sort of just fades away and goes silent. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is to look at Australia as in the interwar years but giving a lot of prominence to the Great Depression because I think we often uh, forget that Australia had suffered one of the highest casualty rates of any of the British Empire armies during World War I and then suffered within 10 to 11 years after the war um, a very intense depression with some of the highest unemployment rates in the world, perhaps only exceeded by Germany and the United States. And so we've got a generation that somehow survived both the terrible war and the Great Depression and then, of course, another world war. So I've been trying to look at this question of the resilience of the society as much as um, as its weaknesses because, obviously, using the title Broken Nation, I thought enormous damage was impact, uh, uh, inflicted on Australian society. But at the same time, the societal structures and the individuals actually generally survive and somehow continue to function. The other thing I've been very interested in, and probably more so than I was when I wrote Broken Nation, is on the economic legacy of the war. And it's becoming increasingly clear as scholars look at the interwar years in greater depth and with a new perspective, is that the economic legacy of the war was particularly damaging. And for Australia, that was very much the case that we're left with a war debt of considerable proportions. And then in order to try and rebuild Australian society, our governments borrowed very heavily from, from uh, particularly Britain and was, were then left very exposed in the late 1920s. There's a perception that the men who came back from the First World War were almost universally damaged, that they struggled, and then somehow they found a way through and built the Great Ocean Road and built the Harbour Bridge and soldiered on and came together with their mates for a beer every Anzac Day and then rebuilt the whole country. Is that an accurate perception of what Australia was like immediately after the First World War? Well, I think our problem is that we, we speak about the returned soldiers as if they were a sort of undifferentiated cohort. There, there was enormous variation among them, as indeed, the, of course, there was amongst the men of, of the first AOF. Um so we have a group that we hear a great deal about, the people who simply didn't cope or um, had such grievous injuries as a result of World War One that they died within a short period of their return. And people who are now analysing the repatriation record, there's a big team at the University of Melbourne that is doing this under the leadership of Janet McCalman, I think are identifying that there were a significant number of men who died relatively quickly after the war, but the, the, once they'd got through that, those who got through that period of of the af, immediate aftermath of the war probably had a similar life expectancy to to the rest of Australian men. So you've got that group that um, were very badly wounded and and did not survive. Then you've got 
a whole group of men, because, you know, 150,000 of them came home with wounds. You've got a whole group of them who somehow get on with life and uh, who, despite their injuries, probably put together a life that was relatively productive, though there are a lot of value judgments about what having a productive life might have been. And then you've got, of course, the other part of Australian society that did not serve in the war. And as I pointed out in Broken Nation, only 40% of men of military age volunteered. So you've got a whole cohort of people who did not experience the war and who were, as we know, profoundly divided around the issue of conscription and and, um, sectarian loyalties. So I think it's a quite complex picture uh, in the 1920s and that's one of the challenges of trying to speak about resilience and communities because they differed in many respects one from the other. Do you think our modern experience of soldiers coming back from Vietnam and more recent conflicts with PTSD and the effects we've seen on more modern soldiers, does that colour our impression of the soldiers of the Great War and, and, and the struggles they would have faced when they came back to I, Australia? I think it undoubtedly does. And the fact that today we are much more open about mental illness, particularly men having mental illness than, than previous generations were able or willing to, to be. Um, without in any sense diminishing the, the trauma and significance of PTSD, it is again only a proportion of soldiers who return from combat uh, with lasting psychological um, damage or psychological damage of levels that really impairs on the functionality um, that they are able to to experience. And you you read in many texts that sort of war leaves all men damaged. It probably does in some ways, but... I don't think we should assume that, that all men were left with, you know, as, as wrecks, both emotionally and physically. The common quote that we hear bandied around is that Australia was going to build a land fit for heroes and that there was this great um, official desire that men would be well regarded and well rewarded for the, their service to their country. How far did we fall short of that ideal, in your estimation? Well, I, this is a question I think we're still looking for answers to. Um, as you may know, the Department of Repatriation has released the records of the, of the AIF personnel, it's correspondence between the returned soldiers and the Department of Repatriation. And from this, we're going to be able to get a much clearer picture of how well soldiers' injuries were diagnosed and how well they what kind of medical treatment they received. And I think our, our understanding of this will change as, as this research continues. There is a very popular perception that these soldiers were treated badly by the government. Um, but modern research suggests that the scheme that we call the repat, repatriation, was probably the most generous of any governments after World War One. There were pensions, there were medical care, hospital care and so on, for preferential employment, vocational training. That said, there was always a gap really between what the government provided and what the men and their families thought they needed and in some cases thought they were entitled to. The question that I pose is, could the Australian government have afforded more? Uh, The repatriation scheme was a huge financial burden on the Australian state Uh, probably in the late 1930s, it was perhaps taking up a fifth of government expenditure. Um, So while soldiers and magazines such as Smith's Weekly and the RSL were always saying not enough is being done, actually quite a lot was being done. Um, And so that's not to diminish the suffering that men experienced, but perhaps there were limits to what the state, the Australian state, could do to, to limit that suffering. Then, of course, you've got the, the notorious soldier settler scheme, um, the great vision of settling the land with small farmers, which I think is universally conceded not to have been well conceived and to have been very poorly implemented. You know, the stories are legion about men without an arm trying to manage a farm, um, men being given blocks of land that had no water supply, very poor soil, 
undercapitalized and so on. And many of those soldiers failed. Um, and there are human tragedies galore in, in that story of, of soldier settlement. The interesting thing about soldier settlement was that it wasn't just a response to the war and the desire to give soldiers you know, a, a healthy lifestyle that, that supposedly helped them to readjust to civilian life. It was probably the last hurrah of the great Australian dream of you know, populating the continent, making deserts turn into into blooming orchards and so on. And and for a long time, Australians dreamt about what we call closer settlement of the land, the small farmer, and, and of course, the, in most instances, the land simply would not support that kind of agriculture. It would support larger, set, larger um, economic enterprises, but not the small ones that they tried to create in the 1920s. So it was a, it was a, I suppose in some ways, an admirable vision, but it was one that really wasn't con- compatible with with the realities of Australia. There seems, I mean, looking back at this remove of a century down the track, there seems almost a naivety to the the soldier settlement scheme and this mm. this this ideal that it, it almost buys into this myth that every Australian that went off to the war was a country lad who was good riding his horse and and. So hmm. settling him on the land would be a wonderful thing for him. What we know is that most of the men were from the cities and had worked in factories yes. and, and it was going to be always a difficult transition to especially some of, as you say, some of the in, inhospitable blocks they were given to farm when many of them had no experience on the land at all. Yes, many of them did just have the skills, let alone the physical strength to, to, to farm the land that they were given. I think we overlook often the an additional group that were brought out uh, to farm Australian land. And these were British immigrants. Now, in the 1920s, there was a huge movement to, I think, in some senses, make up the demographic gap uh, created by World War One by bringing out British boys, as they were often called. Um, and the certain elements of the British government were very keen on this idea of tying the empire back together again through population movements. And also Britain itself had major problems of unemployment after World War I. So the British and Australian governments jointly worked to try and bring a lot of young men out to farm Australian land. The most famous scheme probably is the Big Brother scheme. And uh, many of those immigrants arrived just in time to hit the recession and then the depression at the end of the 1920s. And I've just been reading some, you know, very bitter letters from them to government agencies about, you promised us land, you promised us support, we've been brought out to this wasteland. And there's some very sad stories you know, of, of British women who'd come out, <laughs> one of them in the Mallee, sort of looking around at this dust and uh, and heat and saying, and I came from Devon where everything was so green. So that's another story that's it's of, of closer settlement that in some ways has the same human drama and sadness as, as the soldier settler stories. There's no doubt that the 20s and 30s were obviously a pretty difficult time around the world, but in, in Australia in particular. How much of that do you think is a result of the experience of war and what these... If, if you were a man and a family man who was struggling in the 1920s and 30s, how much of it do you think could be traced to war experience and PTSD and these things that came directly out of the First World War? And how much of it was economic? How much of it was simply that the country was in a poor economic state and, and struggled through the Depression? Well, I think we, we've got to sort of break the 20s up a bit. Um, there was, when the men came back in 1919, of course, first of all, there was the additional tragedy of the Spanish flu, but once that had been contained and had, had faded, you get a, a slight boom in the economy because there's lots of men back and they're buying things, and they're buying homes and, and with the help of the government and they're getting married, having children. Then there's a, a period of short recession. And then from much of the mid-20s, things were not so bad, particularly in the capital cities. Um, I mentioned the Australian governments, both state and federal, borrowed huge amounts of money on the London money market in the 1920s and they used that largely for public works, building infrastructure. So developing the suburbs with uh, sewerage and and the sort of kind of services that uh, urban growth required. That meant that there was a period when manufacturing was also growing. So if you'd ask people in 1924 
1925, perhaps what life was like, you would have got a reasonably positive answer. What we now know is that from about 1927 on, in fact quite a, a long time before the stock market crash in New York in October 1929, Australia is entering a, a quite serious period of recession and then it some, falls over the cliff, so to speak, into the depression. And what my research on, on the 20s is showing is that some of the traditionally um, impoverished suburbs of the cities are in serious social distress as early as 1927. So you find suburbs like Balmain in Sydney, Port Adelaide, Richmond, Footscray in, in Melbourne. The local councils are saying by 1928, we cannot manage the social distress. And what is also happening in this period is, is very high levels of industrial unrest as the Bruce government, conservative Bruce government, tries to take on the unions and the arbitration um, system. So some areas, such as the coal mines around the Hunter Valley, you know, are in serious social and economic trouble, not just because of what's happening to their industries, but because um, they've already gone on strike. There's long strikes and bitter strikes. So I think, again, when we're looking at Australia, we've got to sort of have a bit more fine gra finely grained look at, at different regions, different parts of society. If you were middle class and professional, in the Great Depression. Okay, you might not have got as many new dresses as you wanted, but you were not uh, at the point of starvation. And indeed, there's a great debate going on amongst historians as to whether the social distress in Australia in the late 20s and the early 1930s was as bad as we now remember it. Um, one historian, David Potts, has written a book which argues, look, if you look at Rates of malnutrition, yes, there was some malnutrition. There was very little evidence of starvation in Australia. And this is not to say that people weren't deeply, deeply traumatised by long periods of unemployment. But I think that there is nothing in Australia of the scale of, say, the great movements of population that you saw in the United States. And if you've read John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, that's story of, of on a scale which so far as I can see didn't occur in Australia and talking about who who was most vulnerable at times of economic distress and probably you could say this of the returned soldier cohort as well it's probably the men who were not part of a community who were loners who somehow you know were pushed to the margins of society and what we what we know about resilience, which is a very difficult concept to be at, you know, scientifically precise about, but resilience seems to be stronger when you've got a strong family, good childhood, strong community, um, and so on. And so we have these images from the Great Depression of the man with his rather mangy dog, you know, the, the swagman going from farm to farm, trying to get some meat, selling a cotton reel or something like this, and then camping out on his own at night. That kind of man existed and was was no doubt very vulnerable during the Great Depression. But other communities probably, through mutual support, managed to mitigate the worst effects of the Great Depression. I think if you had a family to go back to, extended family networks... That was some buffer against economic um, distress. And one of the things that people had in the 20s and 30s that we don't have so much today were backyard gardens, the good old chooks. And as Wendy Lowenstein said in her, her book about when she did oral history of the Great Depression, there was always the rabbit. Um, you know, you could... So... Um, I know when, when I finish my work on the Great Depression, I'll almost certainly be asked, well, could it happen again? <laughs> and, and what would be our capacity to survive another Great Depression? And I, I do wonder whether, because people live now in very different social contexts, isolated in, in urban apartments, dependent on the supermarket, you know, whether our capacity to sort of soldier through periods of great economic and social distress is, is diminished now. 
I often wonder when we think about this period and the Depression in particular, having spoken to relatives who lived through it, and one of the things that strikes me is the idea of the the lone swagman going from farm to farm mm. seeking work and the, the, the family that couldn't feed themselves. For want of a better word, these are the sexy elements that mm. are recorded in poetry, that the media will report on, and that probably people will remember who went through it. There's probably a... From my position, there's probably an inability for people to remember the hardworking, resilient families that just got on with it and did okay. It's those shocking stories that are going to stand out. Do you think that's part of the story, that we remember the extremes of the Depression? Oh. We remember the, 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 the terrible stories and we overlook the, the thousands of people who just got on with it? Undoubtedly. Um, uh, I've recently done some work on th- three soldiers, who, um, who, two of whom suicided during the Great Depression and one of whom did not. The two suicides are quite famous men, uh, General Pompey Elliott of the 15th Brigade and um, Hugo Throssell, who won the Victoria Cross and lived in West Australia. They both committed suicide during the Great Depression, but the third person I looked at was a man called Charles Hawker, a South Australian, who'd actually fought with the British Army during World War I because he was the son of a quite wealthy pastoralist and he was at Cambridge when the war broke out. Now, he was appallingly wounded during the war. He lost an eye, he had nerve damage in an arm, he um, was paralysed from the waist down, and yet with the kind of determination that we see evident, I think, in today's Paralympians, he just decided this was not going to stop him from achieving what he wanted to in life. And ultimately, he... He was a federal parliamentarian and was considered as a possible successor to Joe Lyons in the late 1930s, except he died in a plane crash. He wasn't the pilot, so you can't attribute this to suicide. (laughs) But what I find intriguing is I've told the story of these three men in many public meetings now, and virtually nobody's heard of Charles Hawker, unless they're South Australian, because there's an electorate named after him. Um, So we don't... We don't know about the man who survived, but we do know about the two men who died and whose military careers, of course, were, were more famous. And more generally, I think, you know, we, we tend to focus now on trauma and catastrophe because, yes, it's inherently very interesting. And then we don't look at those many, many people who's quiet, ordinary lives just continued with their usual uh, ups and downs and difficulties and, and, and successes. And this is true of, of the battles of World War I. Um, as you no doubt know, the five memorials commemorating the Australian divisions on the Western Front, all but one of them is at a site of a victory. And the 5th Division chose to put their memorial at Polygon Wood. But now the 5th Division's most famous battle, probably, is from hell. Um, the 4th Division, which we all know for Bullet Corps, chose to put their memorial at the Hindenburg Line, where they broke through the Hindenburg Line in 1918. So it's widely accepted. We now have a narrative of victimhood and catastrophe, not of victory and resilience and... Uh, so the stories of our understanding of the past is, I think, somewhat distorted by that. I'm going to ask you a fairly broad question now, and hopefully, hopefully it's not too broad that you'll uh, you'll want to answer it. <laughs> but just just for those of us who who don't, myself included, who don't have this depth of knowledge about this really important period of, of Australia, what did it mean at this time to be Australian? What did Australians believe in? What motivated them? <clears throat> How did they see themselves at the time? compared to how we see ourselves now. Yes, well, the first thing to say about Australians at that time was that they were still overwhelmingly Anglo-Celtic, but within that that British um, community, there were the well-known divisions between Protestants and Catholics, um, and that remained a very profound division in Australian life, really probably until about the 1950s or 60s. Um, But... As I've already indicated, even those who were, say, Irish Australians still accepted generally the description of themselves as being British. We were British subjects. 
actually in law until the 1980s. Um, so Australian nationality has been a rather sort of a, a, a concept that's difficult to define. We talk a lot today, and indeed they talked at, at the time, about Gallipoli being the foundation of the Australian nation. But Australia in the 1920s and 1930s still was very much part of the British Empire. Uh, everything that Stanley Bruce imagined as a Prime Minister was anchored in the idea of Australia being a very vibrant, distinctive, but nonetheless integral part of the British Empire. So too Billy Hughes, his predecessor and Joe Lyons. None of them challenged this idea that you were, that Australia was still a dominion within the wider British Empire. That doesn't mean they didn't have a sense that Australia had its own distinctive interests, but they, their notion of Australian sovereignty was not one that would be particularly uh, familiar to today's Australians. And indeed, when when the um, whole understanding of what was a relationship between Britain and the Dominion started to change in the interwar years, that agenda was driven by the Canadians much more, and to some degree by the Irish, much more than by Australians. Australians weren't really interested in changing the constitutional relationship with Britain. So the same kind of what we call dual nationalism that drove Australia's willingness to fight World War I continued right through the interwar years. So Menzies says in 1939, when Britain declares war on Germany, Britain is at war and so Australia's at war. It wasn't technically correct at that time, but there was no, no serious contest with, of that view, even in 1939. Do you think it's an odd thing that today we feel so closely aligned to the people of this generation, the First World War, the Diggers, Anzac Day, we, we hold them up as icons of what it means to be Australian. But it always strikes me as we probably wouldn't recognise them very well. We, we, we probably, if we could we sit would, down with them, people of our own like age, them. we wouldn't relate to them very no, well. No, we wouldn't like them. They is were it, racist, they were misogynist. <laughs> is, it an odd, is it an odd thing that, uh, that it seems a little bit uniquely Australian that we revere these people in a very two-dimensional way. It's not in any way because we know who they are, but we have an ideal of them that which, which we revere. Is it an odd thing that we cast back to Australia that probably never existed? Oh, I think, I think most countries have these kinds of, um, and I use the word technically, mythologised episodes of their past. They vary from country to country. Um, and for whatever, you know, for complex reasons, Gallipoli has become that kind of foundational narrative and the Anzacs are the integral part of that narrative. Um, I have said on many occasions that I think perhaps we overestimate the engagement of today's Australians with the Anzac legend. Now that has caused me to be criticised in some circles, but there is no doubt that the government governments of both political persuasions, the Australian War Memorial and other agencies in Australia have promulgated very strongly um, this memory of war in the last 20 to 30 years and I think it has resonated very powerfully with certain sections of Australian society, particularly those who are interested in tracing their ancestors um, back to, to World War I. What some historians would say is going on is that people are positioning their own family history, for which, which has been a huge boom, in the wider national narrative. But I am not sure how different, particularly um, more recent immigrants to Australia, engage with the Anzac Day, or if they do at all. And um, I often tell a story about my own experience on the 23rd of April, uh, 2015, that is two days before the, the big ceremony at Gallipoli on the centenary of the landing. I was in Melbourne and I was quite interested in this question of whether um, Australia, whether Anzac resonates with multicultural Australia or not. And uh, my taxi driver, as is many, often the case in Melbourne, was a Punjabi. Originally, he'd been in Australia for five years and was a permanent resident. 
And I said to him, would you mind if I asked you what you think of Anzac Day? Two days before the 25th. And there was a long pause, and then he said, has it got something to do with banks? <laughs> he thought it was bank holiday. And then I said, does the name Gallipoli mean anything to you? And another long pause, and he said, I think it may be a film. So I, I found that extraordinary that he had been here for five years and had seemed not to know anything about the Anzac legend. I suspect if you'd gone out to Box Hill Market, which is a very heavily Chinese Australian area, nothing would have been happening on Anzac Day. So I, I think we have to accept that the, the narrative of Anzac has resonated very powerfully, but may not have done so across the nation. How do you think this period should be remembered? It's, it's, it's a, we've, we've dug into a few layers here of complexity. What's your, is, is there a simple summation of how we should look back in this period? What should we remember? Where it should fit in our story of how we see ourselves? No, I don't think there's, there's a simple or single answer to that. I mean, I think how you judge World War I probably um, reflects your own values and the values of today's society. Um, it's often said about memory of war, which is a different phenomenon to the history of war, you know, professional history, is that memory tells us much more about the people who are remembering than it does about what actually happened in the past. Um, and when I was a young student, we thought World War I was the absolute ultimate episode of futility. And no one would have found it, the language of honouring the Anzacs resonated very strongly at all because the war in the 1960s, World War I, was seen as just a catastrophe. Personally, I think it was a catastrophe for Europe and for, and for the whole of the 20th century. And I do think there is the potential, the risk in commemorating World War I in the way we do today of forgetting how catastrophic it was. It, there's a, some of the commemoration and, and remembrance of World War I has become sanitised and almost sentimentalised and commercialised. I mean, you take trips to Ypres, there are poppies on everything. I, I often say that myself, that I, I struggle with the hypocrisy of what I do, that I am part of the reason that Australians embrace the Anzac legend, yet at the same time I'm trying to, with interviews like this one, try to tell a deeper story. Mm. So there's no simple answers to any of this. Yes. There? And I, um, as we mentioned, you know, the title of my book is Broken Nation. I think we have to say that World War I was a disaster for Australia. And Australia's national and development and the lives of individuals would have been infinitely better had it not had World War I not occurred. Well, Professor Beaumont, thank you so much for taking the time. It's a fascinating subject that I, I think we don't ask these questions often enough, and I've just really enjoyed my time talking. I'm, I'm really looking forward to your next book coming out on depression, and perhaps we'll have you back on the podcast to talk about that one when it comes out. But um, just thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. It's been fun talking.